In this lesson, we're going to go over the most frequently tested and highest yielding areas of corporations on the bar exam in 60 minutes or less. Or in other words, we're going to go over the absolute must know stuff in corporations for the bar exam, which historically, if we look at the data, is going to be shareholder liability, director and officer liability, and ultimately the relationship between parent corporations and their subsidiaries. Typically, these are the areas where we're going to be most opportunities to collect points on the bar exam in corporations. So these are the areas I'm really going to try to break down as best as I possibly can over the next 60 minutes or so. But with that, I can just set our timer to one hour. Ready, set, go. So the clock has officially started. We can jump right into corporations. And the best place to start with corporations is formation, right? How do we go about forming a corporation, right? If you remember from our last video, we said some types of partnerships, there really were formality requirements. Other types of partnerships, like the general partnership, we said there really weren't formality requirements needed, right? Two buddies could form a general partnership without any paperwork, right? What do we need for a corporation to be formed? Right, well, we'll see, right, that the articles of incorporation, right, there is going to be documentation that we call the articles of incorporation. These documents have to be filed properly with the Secretary of State, right? And there's going to be all kinds of requirements there that we'll put below the video. But the big picture idea here that we need to be aware of is in order to form a corporation, the articles of incorporation have to be properly filed with the Secretary of State. We do have formality requirements needed, right? Those formality requirements have to be complied with in order to form a corporation. But once a corporation is formed, right, who are the major players involved, right? We'll see for our purposes on the bar exam, there's really three parties involved in the corporation that we need to be aware of, right? We have the shareholders, we have the board of directors, and we have officers of the corporation, right? These are the three parties that are typically involved in bar exam fact patterns that deal with corporations, right? So who are the shareholders, right? Well, the shareholders are essentially the owners of the corporation. Typically, a shareholder is going to confer some sort of benefit to the corporation, usually money, in exchange for shares of ownership in the corporation, right? Important to recognize that a shareholder can be a person or it could be a business entity, right? We see this in parent subsidiary relationships where the parent is the wholly owned shareholder, the parent is the shareholder that owns its subsidiary, right? This is a wholly owned subsidiary, right? But typically, right, shareholders we think of as people, right? People can be shareholders, right? So a person, an individual can be a shareholder of a business. Business entities can be shareholders of corporations, right? We can have one shareholder, we can have millions of shareholders, right? Corporations range in scale and size to a huge degree, right? There's a lot of variance. And on the bar exam, you can be dealing with really small corporations that are just a few people, right? You have three people involved, who you have three people who are the shareholders of the corporation. You could be dealing with a publicly traded company on a national stock exchange where you have millions of shareholders. You know, the good news is on the bar exam, the analysis won't change that much, whether we're dealing with a really large corporation or a really small corporation, right? The most of the principles, right, are going to stay the same no matter the size of the corporation. But it is worth noting, right? We can have just a few shareholders. We can have millions of shareholders. Lots of possibilities there, right? So who are the directors, right? Our next key party is the board of directors, right? Well, the board of directors ultimately has from the inception of the corporation, full management and control of the corporation, right? The board of directors ultimately has the most power at the corporation usually, right? The board of directors is going to have full management and control of the corporation. Now, typically what happens is the board of directors, especially for larger corporations, right? The board of directors is going to delegate the day-to-day -day operations and functions of the business to officers, right? The chief executive officer, the chief financial officer, the president, the vice president, 
right? All of these roles are usually officers of the corporation, right? And so the board of the board of directors is going to delegate that more day-to-day -day types of functions to officers, right? Especially when we're dealing with larger corporations. And really the board of directors is going to have the primary goal of kind of big picture stuff, right? Just making sure that the shareholders' investments are being protected, right? That's really the key function of the board of directors. They're looking out for the best interests of their shareholders, right? The directors then delegate that management aspect, day-to-day -day operations typically to officers, right? This is how we get the CEO, the CFO, right? The president, the vice president. Those officers are going to have more of a day-to-day -day management role of the actual affairs of the business. Board of directors you can think of as kind of more long-term planning, right? Board of directors is obviously able to uh, remove officers. They bring up, they appoint officers, they remove officers. They can do that basically at any time with or without cause, right? There could be contractual issues, obviously, right if they enter into employment contracts with officers right they could be in breach of contract but from a corporation standpoint right typically the board of directors is able to appoint and remove officers at will right so the board of directors is kind of the highest power at the corporation then they're going to delegate day-to-day -day functions to officers the shareholders are the owners right that's typically how it works right that's our big picture parties for you know the big picture who's involved at least on the bar exam right those are the parties we want to be aware of in a corporation right so once we understand kind of you know how a corporation is formed and who the key players are right the shareholders the directors and the officers well the next question then becomes and what kind of is the most tested issue in corporations on the bar exam is going to be okay well when are the shareholders liable when are the directors liable and when are the officers liable right and with this we'll see that there's a lot of overlap between parent corporations when we're dealing with subsidiaries and all of these analyses we're going to talk about because remember a parent corporation can be the shareholder of a subsidiary, right? So sometimes our shareholder will actually be a corporation. So we need to just be aware of that in our analysis. But big picture, right? The idea is going to be when we get to the call of the question, we're going to see most of our issues revolve around either shareholder liability or director and officer liability, right? Call of the question is going to ask you, is this shareholder liable or is this director liable? Is this officer liable? Is this parent corporation liable? Right, and we're going to talk about how you do these different analyses and we can start with shareholder liability. Right, and remember, this goes back to our common thread. Who is liable to who? As we go through business associations, right? we start with agency relationship to partnerships, now in corporations, we see that idea, right? Who is liable to who? Well, when we're dealing with corporations, it's is the shareholder potentially liable? Is the director liable? Is the officer liable? Right, and this is how we do the different analyses. Right, and we can start with the shareholder. Right, so our starting point rule with shareholders is very similar to our limited liability partnership, if you remember from our last le lesson, right? Shareholders enjoy limited liability protection, meaning, right, generally, shareholders of a corporation are not liable for the debts and obligations of the corporation. Right? This includes parent corporations. If a parent corporation is a shareholder, right, they're going to enjoy limited liability protection, which means that corporations, right, shareholders are not personally liable for the debts and obligations of the corporation right that's always your starting point rule shareholders enjoy limited liability protection right so really the main exception to this is the doctrine of piercing the corporate veil where we'll say however courts will allow a creditor to pierce the corporate veil and hold a share a share holder liable for the debts of the corporation when any of these situations are met right number one where the shareholder has dominated the corporation to the extent that the corporation may be considered the shareholder's alter ego. Number two, if the shareholder fails to follow corporate formalities. Number three, if the corporation was undercapitalized at its inception. Or number four, if we have a fraudulent or illegal purpose involved, right? Then in that case, it'll be pretty obvious that we can pierce the corporate veil. 
So big picture, what we're looking at here, we're talking about the doctrine of piercing the corporate veil, is essentially this, right? So we have the shareholder and we have the corporation, right? The more distinct those two entities are, the shareholder and the corporation, the more we can separate those two things, the harder it is to pierce the corporate veil. But the more that those things become blurred, right, where the shareholder and the corporation become kind of co-mingled and blurred, right, then we can start to pierce the corporate veil because it's hard to really distinguish at that point, okay, who's the shareholder, who's the corporation, right, at that point when we can kind of merge them into one thing, right, that line, that distinction between this is the shareholder, this is the corporation, the more that gets blurred, right, the easier it is to pierce the corporate veil. This is what we're talking about when we're talking about the alter ego, right, where the shareholder has dominated the corporation to the extent that the corporation may be considered the shareholder's alter ego, right? This would probably be most obviously illustrated by flow of money, right? Say that you have a shareholder, right, who owns a corporation, right, the majority shareholder of a corporation, Right, and that shareholder is really using the corporate form to pay off all of his own personal bills, his credit card bills, his car payment, his home payment, right, his rent for whatever, all of his food and dining, his entertainment, right? He's using the corporate bank account and corporate expense accounts, right, to pay for all of his own personal stuff. Right, the more that we have this flow of money, right, especially when there's not really procedure, there's no formality, it's just kind of this free flow of money between the shareholder and the corporation. Right, that's the easiest way that we see this distinction get blurred. Okay, who's the corporation, who's the shareholder? If there's a free flow of money between the two of them, right, well, they start to really blend together, right? So when we see that free flow of money, where there's no really process or procedure, right, shareholders kind of loaning money to the business, business corporations loaning money to the shareholders, going back and forth, and there's no formality, that's a situation where it's going to be pretty easy to pierce the corporate veil, veil where we're going to say, look, the shareholder's dominating the corporation to the extent that the corporation is really the shareholder's alter ego at this point, right? The shareholders using the corporation as a mere instrument, a vehicle, right, to get some protection, some liability protection, but it's just using it as an instrument to pay off his own personal things, right? That line is really getting blurred, right? That's the idea of alter ego. Corporate formalities goes hand in hand with this, right? If the corporation's not really following corporate formalities, right, we have this free flow of money or just any lack of corporate formalities, right? Typically, right, if we're going to have distributions to shareholders, there needs to be a process, a procedure, formulas in place. We can't just have money flowing around without processes, without procedures, right? Typically, you know, we're going to want to see all kinds of corporate formalities. We're going to see, want to see regularly scheduled meetings at those meetings. We want to see documentation. We want to see detailed records and bookkeeping, right? And we want everything being documented, processes, procedures, right? There's all kinds of corporate formalities that we'd like to see a corporation following. And the more corporate formalities we can see, well, that shows, okay, well, we have a legitimate corporation, right? The more formal it looks, right? Well, okay, then we, that is evidence of that distinction, right? But when a corporation is really lazy, kind of, right, and it's not really following those formalities, Right, what does that start to do? It starts to blur that line where, right, again, where you have free flow of money without processes and procedures. There's not really meetings happening. There, nothing's being documented or recorded. Right, well, if we don't have any of the formalities, you know, what's the distinction between the shareholder and the corporation at this point? Right, if we don't have any documentation, records, bookkeeping, you know, all of this type of stuff we'd want to see at a corporation, it just blurs that line. And the more that line gets blurred, the more that the corporation and the shareholder kind of come into one, that's when we can pierce the corporate veil and get to the shareholder's personal assets, right? Hold the shareholder personally liable for the debts and obligations of the corporation because it's very hard to distinguish the corporation from the shareholder. Another example of this is undercapitalization, right? So if you're going to start a corporation, shareholder wants to incorporate a you know, new corporation, if they do so 
but it's heavily undercapitalized, right? The shareholder fails to adequately fund the corporation at its inception to cover debts and prospective liabilities, right? So you know you're starting a corporation and that business needs hundreds of thousands of dollars to get off the ground, right? To cover its debts and prospective liabilities in the very immediate future, you know that business really needs like hundreds of thousands of dollars. Say you only put $5,000 in the bank account to start that business. Right? Well, that's evidence that you really don't care about the success or failure of this business. You're using it as an instrument to give yourself some liability protection to go accomplish some task, right? It's just a, it's a mere instrument. It's a vehicle you're using to try to shield your personal assets while you go accomplish some task, right? If it's that type of undercapitalization, it just shows that you're not really serious about the corporation. The shareholder is not really serious about the success or failure of this business, right? They're using it obviously as some sort of shell, some sort of instrument, right? And that line just is, that usually is going to go hand in hand with corporate formalities, right? Where we see the corporations not really following procedures, there's not formalities, it's undercapitalized, right? That's gonna be evidence of alter ego. It all just kind of blends together, right? And when it just blends together, the shareholder and the corporation blend, Right, that's when you can pierce the corporate veil. Of course, if you're setting up a corporation for some sort of fraudulent or illegal purpose, then you can pierce the corporate veil, right? If you're setting this up as a pure shell company, right, you're setting up a corporation to go commit fraud or something like that, yes, then obviously you can pierce the corporate veil. That'd be pretty obvious in the fact pattern. But usually it's these first three kind of all go hand in hand, right? where you actually have the shareholder dominating the corporation to the extent that the corporation is considered the shareholder's alter ego. There's that lack of corporate formalities, right? There's undercapitalization. All of this kind of mixes together to show, look, the shareholder's not really serious about this corporation. He's using it as some sort of instrument or vehicle, right? There's just that blend. The line's getting blurred between what's the shareholder, what's the corporation, right? The more it gets blended, the easier it is to pierce the corporate veil. So we have an example here from a real bar exam fact pattern. All of these right here I've pulled from actual bar exam fact patterns to kind of illustrate the points. Right, obviously I've changed the uh, names of parties so I can keep it all straight in my head, but this is all pulled directly from actual bar exam fact patterns. Right, so let's say that we have a parent company, right? A parent company that is owned equally by three shareholders. Let's say Amy, Bobby, and Christopher. And let's say at some point our parent company incorporates a subsidiary, right? And so it's a wholly owned subsidiary, meaning that the shares are owned 100% by Parent Incorporated. Okay, and let's say that our parent company right, to mirror this bar exam fact pattern, let's say our parent company is a cereal company, right? They manufacture, produce, and distribute cereal, right? So they harvest corn, right, that they grow at their farm, and they use this, and they have some sort of corn-based cereal that they manufacture and sell, right? Well, let's say that Amy is a geneticist, right? And so Amy wants to experiment with genetically engineered corn. She does this and she finds a way to produce cereal where they don't have to grow crops, right? So they don't have to actually grow corn in like a farm environment. She can genetically produce it in a lab, right? So Amy discovers this. So they want to create a spin-off company. So you can think of the parent incorporated company, our parent Inc, as like their value brand cereal. And then the genetically modified corn that they're producing in the lab, they can call maybe like a value brand. So our parent company would be like premium brand cereal and our subsidiary might be like value brand cereal, right? The subsidiary is wholly owned by the parent company. Right, so let's say though, ultimately, there's a problem with the genetically modified cereal. It's making people sick, right? So people are getting sick from eating this genetically modified cereal. So ultimately, we have a plaintiff who comes along and obtains a judgment against the subsidiary, right? That's making this genetically modified cereal. Right? Well, let's say that subsidiary A, right, our value brand cereal company, is insolvent, right? It has no money. Our subsidiary, the parent subsidiary, has no money. 
So what's the plaintiff going to want to do? Well, the plaintiff in that case is going to want to hold the parent company liable for that judgment, right? So subsidiary A has a debt, right? The shareholder of subsidiary A is parent incorporated. The question is, can our plaintiff obtain that debt from the parent company? Well, our starting point rule is, well, the parent company is a shareholder of subsidiary A. Our starting point rule is that generally shareholders of a corporation are not liable for the debts of the corporation. But we know this idea of piercing the corporate veil. Right, so we'd have to look at the facts. Right? This would be a very fact-specific analysis. Right? Our starting point rule would be, look, Parent Incorporated is not liable for the debts of subsidiary A unless the plaintiff can pierce subsidiary A's co corporate veil. Right? That's the only way they're going to be able to hold in this fact pattern Parent Incorporated liable for the debts of subsidiary A. Right? So what we would do is go through these four things, right? We'd look for all of this. Well, was the shareholder, right? In this case, Parent Incorporated. Has Parent Incorporated dominated its subsidiary to the point that the subsidiary may be considered the parent company's alter ego, right? So we're looking for that blurred line, right? When they set up this parent company, right? Where, when they set up the subsidiary, right? Were they following corporate formalities? When they set it up, was it capitalized property or was it undercapitalized, right? Was there some sort of fraudulent or illegal purpose? This is all stuff we'd be looking for in the fact pattern. But the main thing would be, you know, how blurred is this? If we saw money flowing from the parent to the subsidiary without any procedure, right? Parent companies just kind of giving a lot of emergency loans to the subsidiary, which in this bar exam fact pattern, what we saw was parent company without really any procedure is just kind of randomly giving a lot of emergency loans to the subsidiary, right? We have this flow of money back and forth without corporate formalities, right? And also the subsidiary was way undercapitalized. They needed like you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, and they started the subsidiary, this gen genetically modified cereal company, with like $5,000. So it was like heavily undercapitalized. There was a lack of corporate formalities. So we could say at that point, yeah, look, the parent company at this point has dominated the subsidiary to the extent that the subsidiary may be considered the parent company's alter ego, right? And we had lack of corporate formalities, we had undercapitalization. So in that case, the plaintiff could have, hold, could have held the parent company liable. You're able to pierce the corporate veil when all of that's going on. But then the question is, okay, so Parent Inc. might be liable. Well, can we now pierce, say that parent, the parent company is also bankrupt. So in this case, subsidiary A has no money and parent incorporated has no money, right? The value brand cereal is bankrupt and the premium brand cereal is bankrupt. So now what's the plaintiff want to do? Well, plaintiff wants to come after Amy, Bobby, and Christopher. So can Amy, Bobby, or Christopher be held liable? Well, Amy, Bobby, and Christopher are shareholders of parent incorporated. So we know they have limited liability protection. Protection, right? Generally, Amy, Bobby, and Christopher are not liable for the debts of Parent Inc. The only way we can get to Amy, Bobby, and Christopher is if we can pierce Parent Inc.'s corporate veil. It's the exact same analysis. In this fact pattern, we saw that Amy, Bobby, and Christopher were much more diligent with their parent company, right? They did follow very extensive corporate formalities. It was property ca properly capitalized, right? When they started the parent company at its inception, they invested half a million dollars into it. So it was way far better equipped from a capitalization standpoint. There was no fraud or illegal purpose. It was a very legitimate serial business. They followed all the corporate formalities, right? The facts gave you that they had detailed meetings. They kept minutes at the meetings. They followed all the corporate formalities. So there was really no way that you could say Amy, Bobby, or Christopher dominated Parent Incorporated to the extent that the corporation could be considered any of their alter egos. Right? You didn't have that type of flow of loans and money without procedure. There wasn't that blur of lines. So in that case, the parent company could be held liable because we could pierce the corporate veil, but Amy, Bobby, and Christopher were not liable Right, the shareholders of the parent company were not personally liable because they couldn't pierce the corporate veil. Right, plaintiff couldn't pierce the corporate veil to get to those shareholders.
right? That's piercing the corporate veil, shareholder liability, right? So essentially, if we're trying to hold shareholders vicariously liable for the debts of the corporation, we want to think about piercing the corporate veil, right? Our starting point rule is shareholders of a corporation are not liable for debts and obligations of the corporation unless, right, our big exception is doctrine of piercing the corporate veil. These are the four factors we kind of want to look at. Okay, next we have director and officer liability for breaches of essentially fiduciary duties, right? So this is the probably most tested area of corporations, right? The duty of care and duty of loyalty, right? Directors and officers owe the corporation a duty of care and a duty of loyalty, right? So big picture, the difference between duty of care and duty of loyalty is duty of care is really just making sure that our directors and officers are exercising reasonable care when they make business decisions, right? Whether or not those business decisions turn out to be good business decisions or bad business decisions, right? The thing that we're focused on with duty of care is only that the business decisions were made with a reasonable amount of care, right? They exercise reasonable care in making the decision. If the decision ultimately ends up being a decision that costs the business money, that doesn't mean necessarily in of itself that we have a violation of the duty of care, right? You can make what ends up being a bad business decision exercising all the care in the world, right? That's duty of care. Duty of loyalty, so you can kind of think of duty of care as trying to prevent negligence, right? We don't want directors and officers making business decisions recklessly or negligently, right? We want them exercising reasonable care. Duty of loyalty is actually where we usually get to wrongful conduct, right? Duty of care is more about, okay, we want to prevent negligence. Duty of loyalty is where we have a director or officer, parent company on both sides of the deal right? It's a conflicting interest transaction. The director, officer, or parent company is really on both sides of a transaction, right? And they're trying to benefit themselves at the expense of their corporation or their subsidiary, right? They're on both sides of the deal and they're really trying to benefit themselves over the corporation, right? And that is where we're going to have some actual, usually what you could say is more purposeful, wrongful conduct, right? There's more of that. They're on both sides of the deal. It's more intentional than the duty of care, which is more just about, you know, preventing negligence, right? So that's kind of big picture, but we can break each of these down separately and look at some examples from the bar exam. Right, so duty of care, we really have four kind of duties that we're thinking about. Thank you so much for watching this video preview of our Bar Blitz video series. If you would like to see the conclusion of this video and gain full access to our entire Bar Blitz video library, which includes coverage of the most frequently tested and highest yielding areas of law in each bar exam subject, we invite you to head over to our website and join the thousands of law students who have already enrolled in Studicata Bar Review to get started started with your no risk free trial today, simply click the link in the description box below or visit www.studicata.com.